All right, starting over, verse 7, clean out the old leaven just uh, so that you may be a new lump just as you are, and I'm going to get rid of the in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, in dealing with um, Christ, our Passover, Passover is the main holiday for Israel. There's other ones. There's Hanukkah. There's um, there, and there's a vast. There's in fact, I remember Eric going through all of the different uh, pa different holidays, and basically it's summarized by by eat, don't eat, eat, don't eat, eat, don't eat. Basically, over and over again, you eat, then you fast. You eat, then you fast. This year, Passover begins sunset on Wednesday, April eight, and concludes Thursday, April sixteenth. Jews all over the world celebrate annually as a remembrance of an event that happened over 3,400 years ago. Uh, the Passover is the main holiday which identifies Israel. If you're going to say which holiday is Israeli, then you would have to say Passover. It is the one that they remember. It's who they are, and they're, 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 uh, most of their identity involves being saved, being redeemed, being um, freed from the nation of Egypt, and, and the process began to go into their own land. Normally, we do not understand that this holiday was not instituted just for a memorial to what God had done, but also as a foreshadow to what God would do. As believers, we should cherish Passover. I'm not saying celebrate Passover. I'm not saying that we should go all and, and all do a Seder, although there are some live Seders going online. I think Eric's even doing one. I'll, if you want, I'll get you dates, and I'm actually planning on watching at least one of them. But it... But we should cherish it. Why? Because here in 1 Corinthians, we have an indication that Passover means something more than simply the situation that happened 3,400 years ago, dealing with the exodus out of Egypt. It has to do with what Christ is for us. So as I said, clean out the old leaven so they may be a new lump, just as you in fact are unleavened for Christ our Passover has been sanctified has been sanct sacrificed the words of Paul are as inspired by the Holy Spirit are a testimony to the reality to the reality of the messianic picture in the Passover account if you go back in the Old Testament and read the Passover without any indication of the New Testament uh, just for sake of pointing out the locations the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek scriptures you really don't get a picture of the redemption of, of an individual spiritually from the ritualistic remembrance of the Passover from Exodus. First of all, the Passover really only saved the firstborn. So if you're a secondborn or parents, generally speaking, the, the Passover, the situation of the death of the firstborn didn't even affect you, except for the fact that you would lose your firstborn, but it wasn't going to cost you your life. So it's not like everybody was preserved um, from death and, and saved into life. So it's kind of hard to see the connection except for the fact that we see it demonstrated for us within the Greek scriptures and the epistles. This lesson will serve as an overview to demonstrate how the Passover account in the Hebrew scriptures is a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. As we remember his sacrifice and rejoice later on in his resurrection and then further stay in awe at his ascension, waiting for his return. One of my favorite like little lines, I can't wait for the ascension because that, that's my favorite line in all of scripture. Why do you stand here looking up into the clouds? <laughs> Didn't you just see what we saw? That's pretty crazy. There are three main passages in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, that provide the information on the Passover. Exodus 12, 1 through 51, Numbers 9, 1 through 14, and Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8. 
Now, there are other passages that do talk about the Passover, but if you want to get a good handle upon not only the reality of the Passover, but the institution, the memorial service that they had on a regular basis, all three passages of Scripture really need to be analyzed. In fact, let's go over there. I'm going to read some choice ones. Obviously, I'm not going to read all 51 verses. You can do that on your own. However, let's go ahead and look at um, these particular locations, these particular passages as we review the actual account. So turn over to Exodus chapter 12 first. Exodus 12. I have verses 1 through 13. Um, I'm going to skip around a little bit, so I'll tell you where I'm jumping to. I'm going to jump like verse 4, for example. So chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is the, to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are, are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to the father's household, a lamb for each household. Verse 5, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or you may take it from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, you shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat of the flesh of that same night, roast it with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Verse 11. Now you shall eat it with this manner, with your loins girded, with your sandals on your feet, with your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on your, on your houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Beginning out with this passage, chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, is the origination of the Passover. This is the first time it's mentioned. It's not mentioned before this. It was given uh, to provide safety from the striking on the land of Egypt. We talked about that when we do it on Wednesday nights, that there was a striking, a beating down on that land. And it is the blood that is the sign. The blood covers the household, indicating it is under protection because of a substitutionary atonement. One of the most... Um, Basic understandings of sacrifice is that the, the life of an innocent pays for the life of the guilty. Some religions actually deny this is even possible. Other religions abuse it. You think of throughout history where people have tried to, to, to just uh, mutilate animals in order to satisfy the gods. You think of people even sacrificing their, their, their children, babies, to uh, fake gods in order to appease the gods so they get rain. And so it has been abused, but there's always been, throughout Scripture, because of sin, an opportunity to sacrifice as an atonement. This is when it first becomes absolutely clear. You get the picture in Isaac, but here we have a mass, um, actual God-provided, God-sanctioned, and he is going to spare the children, the firstborn, because of this sacrificial atonement. In chapter 12, verse 23. For the Lord will pass through and, uh, to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintels of the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and for your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshipped. 
Now, here's the amazing concept. When I taught this back in uh, many, many months ago, we made the observation that the Passover, after this one situation, no longer was a sacrificial atonement. Throughout, when they, when they did the Passover celebrations, it was not to purify them of sins. It was not to save their, their lives. It was not to save their lives of their, of their young ones. It was, a, it, was, it was a memorial. And I believe that to be very intentional, obviously. The other sacrifices recorded in Leviticus were a, a covering over sins to satisfy the judgment of God upon the nation of Israel so that he would not smite them. The Passover was a memorial to remember what he has done. Then there becomes one more Passover, one more Passover lamb. That's the person of Jesus Christ. So it's very unique in how it's being divided. It's not perpetually done in order to execute um, some type of atonement. It's done one time for atonement and done one more time for everyone's atonement. I find that fascinating on how God set that up because it becomes extremely um, sacred because it is, is unique in its act, actual application. Exodus 12, 42. It is a night to be observed for the Lord for having brought them out of the land of Egypt. This night is for the Lord to be observed by all the sons of Israel throughout their generations. Verse 47, all the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. But if you are a stranger, but if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near to celebrate it. And he shall be like a native in the land. But no uncircumcised person may eat of it. The same law shall apply to the natives as to the stranger who sojourn among you. Exodus 12, 42 to 51 gives the rules for believing Gentiles to participate in this remembrance. In this Passover, as long as they are identified with Israel and having been circumcised. They were basically identifying themselves with Israel and with the God of Israel. Now, obviously, this happens in the Old Testament under a different economy, understanding that this is that the the future Passover, a God's lamb, is not as yet to come. But it's still significant to understand that this was not a isolated or a closed door meeting, but they did have to come into and be under the protection of Israel. Numbers chapter nine. He's cool. Numbers chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. I'm going to read just the first three verses here. Thus the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Now let the sons of Israel observe the Passover and its appointed time. On the 14th day of the month at twilight, you shall observe it at the appointed time. You shall observe it according to all its statutes, according to all its ordinances. Numbers 9, 1 through 14 provide the annual date for the observance of Passover. Rules for those who are unclean later on in the chapter, they, have, uh, they are given. They have to wait a month, but they, they do observe it after they're clean again. And restating the statute for the Gentile believers among them. Finally, let's go over to Deuteronomy chapter 16. In verses 1 through 8, we'll go ahead and pick it up in verse 3. You shall not eat leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread. The bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, so that you may remember all the days of the life, uh, that the day that you came out of the land of Egypt. For seven days, no leaven shall be seen with you or with your territory, and none of the flesh which you sacrifice in the evening on the first day remain uh, overnight until morning. In Numbers 9, 1 through 14, provides the annual day for the observance. In Deuteronomy 16, it emphasizes the need to remove leaven. 
from the home as a representation of the haste of leaving Egypt. The eating of the unleavened bread was because they did not have time to let the bread rise, but it also had other significant points of interest. Now, what do these excerpts tell us? They give us details and significance of the Passover, and we will see how they were used to foreshadow the coming Christ. First and foremost, the Passover foreshadows the coming uh, Messiah in four ways. Unleavened bread. Two, that's how the ceremony begins, by the way, is with an unleavened bread. Two, an unlemished lamb would be the sacrifice. The blood of that lamb had to be applied and would cover them for the destroyer to not destroy them. And finally, the Passover was the means for the deliverance of all who identified as or with Israel and the Lord and Jehovah. This is an important concept. There is a means of deliverance. It is not the deliverance. Yes, he spared the children. Yes, he spared the firstborn. But then that was used to, to basically initiate the actual leaving from the land. As we've already kind of read in, 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 uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, um, there are restrictions as to leaven during Passover week. What's interesting is if you go through leaven, there is very little references to understanding leaven as sin. Even in the New Testament, I believe it's really only in one um, portion where leaven deals with it in the concept of sin. The forbidding of leaven and offering was symbolic to the pre-deliverance days in the land of Egypt when they had to leave in haste. The Passover then points to the unleavened bread as the transition from slavery to freedom. So it, because they had to eat bread that was unleavened, unrised, and, no, and basically the yeast didn't have time to, to, uh, to basically ferment. Um, remember, they didn't have little yeast packets. And they had to sprinkle in there. The, the reason it would rise was natural. It would be a natural bacteria that would cause that bread to rise. And one of the reasons why I don't like sourdough is because of a lot of, 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 of bacteria in that bread. Now they bake it out, I know, but it's, it's, it's like blue cheese. Ugh. During the rest of the year, the people were free to have leavened bread. Does that indicate that, hey, for one week, you're going to not sin? And for the rest of the year, sin all you want. Enjoy leaven. Enjoy sin. But for one week, no sin. Of course not. It's, it's, it's representative of, a, of an idea. That Passover was a picture of that transition. Remember Deuteronomy? I wait for it to come up. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 3, you shall not eat it with leavened bread. Okay, seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, a bread of the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste. That's the reason for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste. That's the why you're eating unleavened bread. So that you remember. The not eating unleavened bread, eating that bland, non-risen bread. I mean, a lot of people equate it with matzah anymore, which actually I kind of like matzah, but, you know, it's a cracker. Put a little, put a little hummus on it. It'd be fun. The point of the matter is not that the, the leaven was a, a, an image for sin in here in Deuteronomy, but it was symbolic so that they would remember eating that bland, unleavened bread reminded them of their run. In the New Testament, leaven is used in four distinct passages. Luke 13, 18 through 21, Matthew 16, 1 through 12, Galatians 5, 7 through 10, and 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Now, um, let's go ahead and turn to Luke 13. Luke 13, 18 through 21. We'll go, ahead, we'll go ahead and look at these. 
I'll summarize uh, Matthew 16 for you, but let's go ahead and look at some of these passages. Luke 13, 18 through 21. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? So obviously it's a parable about the kingdom. And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed in which a man took and threw it into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And he get, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. So here we have leaven being compared with what? The spread of the kingdom of, of God. Same thing you idea with the mustard seed. Is leaven here sin? No. In Matthew 16, the actual concept here is leaven is used to deal with the teaching of the Pharisees. Why? Because leaven, if you let it sit, it permeates the entire loaf. It's not like it's going to only permeate the one section of it. So if you listen to, the, to a teaching, and I would say it's either good or bad, uh, especially bad, though. The, the concept here in Matthew is dealing with bad teaching. And you listen to and you absorb some bad teaching. It is going to infect all of you, all of your doctrines. If you let in just a little bit of contamination, it will contaminate the whole lump. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Did I do this again? Oh, it's actually verse 9. Uh, we'll go ahead and read the, for context. Okay, I, I got it now. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, this could be referring back to Matthew and, fall, and bad teaching kind of infiltrating and kind of contaminating the entire lump. However, is leaven here a picture for sin? No, it just it indicates uh, that, that there's a, a little bit of information, a little bit of bad doctrine can infect the whole thing. It's not saying that leaven is sin. It's kind of a, it's it's equating the two bad doctrine to what how leaven infects a whole. In 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, which we've read, is a specific refers to the sins of before. Paul is referring to the Pentateuch. So this is the only passage in which we have, which refers, that a lot of people take it as, I'm going to look at the leaven from the old man perspective, the old sin master. What is happening here is that he is equating the, the, the leaven of the, of, the, of the Egyptian encampment, the Egyptian slavery. And they were under bondage. So he's, he is permitted to, through the Holy Spirit, to take a little bit of allegorical understanding from this to help us understand something of a truth. Sin was the taskmaster before Jesus freed us from that sin. Now, there's two aspects of freedom, penalty and power. Take, let's go back to 1 Corinthians and just take a, another look at this passage. What is the point of 1 Corinthians chapter 5? Therefore, in verse 8, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, not with malice or unwickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he is comparing the old with the unleavenedness of the now. In fact, look at verse 7. And we, if you've ever been listening to any of the lessons in Philippians and Colossians and Romans, we'll always see this happen with Paul. He tells you who you are and then impact how that impacts what you should do, the is and the ought. In verse 7, it says, you are unleavened. That's who you are. This the penalty and the power of sin has been taken away from you. Therefore, do not live by your old slave master. 
which he compares to leaven. Again, do not look at leaven solely as it indicates sin. Leaven indicates a, uh, a picture of, a, of a, something that we're looking at, and the context would dictate how that person is using it. Okay? So you are unleavened. If you sin, do you become leavened? That was a great shake of the head, Luther. No. <laughs> you do not become leavened because you sin. Why? Because you're in Christ. And Christ is our Passover, and he made you unleavened. How can you unmake what God made? Do not misconstrue. This is a very important concept when it comes down to the Passover ideas about unleavened bread. If you sin, you are out of alignment with your true nature. Because God has freed us from both the penalty and the power of sin. And that's the overall main point of verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 5. All right, moving on. Uh, let's take a look at the next point, which is the Lamb of God. Relating to the Passover Lamb, John the Baptist testifies in the Gospel of John, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is safe to say that this is a reference to Christ being the final Passover to take away sin. Remember what we said before, that the original Passover didn't take away sin. It was atonement. OK, there was a death penalty being placed upon all the firstborn. The Passover lamb, each family had to actually slay it and, and put the blood, the lentils, the blood of the lamb on the lentil. And so, therefore, that caused the, the, the destroyer not to, to pass over and not kill. So it, it was not a, um, a, a full sacrificial uh, atonement for the entire nation, but for a particular group. That did not continue. That sacrifice was not perpetual for sacrifice of sin until Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Passover lamb, but this now does not just take over for a small group of people within a whole. It takes on the whole, the sin of the world. Jesus and the Passover lamb as described in Jesus and I'm sorry in Exodus 12 there's a book Jesus I don't think we'd read any other book um, Jesus and the Passover lamb as described in Exodus 12 is a foreshadowing of the Messiah in the fact that they had to be unblemished the unblemished lamb the word unblemished is the is the Hebrew word uh, tamim tamim means complete or perfect Unimpaired, innocent. The lack of physical defects in the Lamb is a symbol of the absolute godly perfection in the Messiah. Hebrews 9 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God? Cleansing your heart, your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How much more will the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So what was physically represented with the lamb uh, that was selected by the families as unblemished, undefected, perfect, unimpaired, innocent, is now fully understood in the unblemished person of Jesus Christ, who did not sin, who did no wrong, no malice came out of his mouth. When reviled, he did not revile back. No sin was found in him. And he was sacrificed as our Passover. The sinless Messiah was now our sacrificial atonement, which gets into the blood sacrifice. The blood sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Now, this gets a little, uh, people get very queasy over this kind of thing because. Um, 
they don't like it. It's not that they don't understand a lot of times, but the fact that something has to die in order to have the guilty live is a big problem for people. Why should uh, an innocent die for a guilty party? Now, God took animals in the Levitical system and the Passover specifically to demonstrate what was to come. You see, one of the, the, the greatest concepts of sacrificial atonement is that most of the sacrificial atonements that are done by mankind, even prescribed by God, is not voluntary based upon the individual who is being sacrificed. I'm pretty sure a little lamb, he didn't go, hey, I'll die for you. Right? It's an animal. Uh, how about those children? And, uh, and, you know, and you always have like, you know, weird stories of uh, people being thrown into volcanoes. Uh, voluntary or not? I've never seen one person volunteer for that job, right? As order to, to try to sacrifice and, and atone for the, for the village. Jesus Christ came purposely, voluntarily, desiring to do so, to be the sacrifice, to willingly put himself on that cross, allowing himself to be mutilated in order for other people to be liberated. The sacrifice of the lamb was a provision for the people. God gave the people a way to escape the curse of death that came upon the land. Why has death come? Hmm? What's the problem? You see, here's one of the, the, the great uh, mysteries that we really don't often look at when it comes to the Passover. Why were the Israeli firstborn also under the penalty of death? Because all are guilty of sin. You see, when it comes down to the guilty and the innocent, um, Sarah and I are watching a show in which an innocent man is put to prison. It's driving us crazy. How can this be? I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's insanity to think about the, um, uh, the, the, the innocent being put behind bars. I got to thinking, is he innocent? Now, on the judicial system, yes. How about before God? Absolutely not. When it comes down to suffering unjustly, God only equates that to one thing. Suffering for the cause of Christ. Suffering for the gospel. Suffering for righteousness sake. I, I remember when I was um, influenced by cousins, so to speak. I hope you're not watching. I forgive you, by the way, in case you're wondering. Influenced by cousins to steal from a convenience store, and we were busted. And I, I never wanted to do it. I was scared doing it. I didn't want to do it. I was, I was, I was very influential. And people just, I wasn't influential. I was highly influenced. There you go. Uh, Pam's like, that's right. That's not the other way around. <laughs> and, um, and I did it. And I got caught. And you know what? I could have said, they, they made me do it. But I knew full well I did it. I couldn't blame anyone else, even though I was being influenced to do a bad thing. So who, who deserved more punishment? We both did it. We all did it. So therefore, we are all worthy of punishment. The wages of sin is death. And the death penalty of, uh, of all people has to be satisfied if you want a chance at life. To the Israelites back in Egypt, they needed a means to be able to escape that death penalty. They were as guilty as the Egyptians. <clears throat> Most people don't look at it that way, but they were. Otherwise, the death penalty would not have come upon them. The difference is the Egyptians did not believe God where the Israelites did. The Egyptians, I believe, were given the means to escape. They did not take it. The Israelites did. They took the means to be able to be preserved. Egypt did not. The Israelites, God selected nations, were not automatically exempt from the curse. They had to apply the blood. This was life exchange. The sacrifice of the lamb for the curse of death of the firstborn, a sacrificial atonement. This also is pictured in, in the Messiah Jesus that his unblemished life, sinless perfection, perfection 
was given as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of the world. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, For there is one God and one mediator, also between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time, as a ransom for all. Galatians 1, 4, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. In the Passover, the blood that was collected and was used to paint the doorposts and lintel was an outward demonstration of the sacrificial lamb that had been sacrificed in the house, and thus protect all the firstborn that were in that house. The Passover is not exclusive to Israel. It begins with Israel, and it has impact upon Israel, but it's not exclusive to Israel. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that Israel did not benefit from, the, from, the, from Jesus Christ the Passover. What I'm saying is it's not exclusive to them. Okay? In Numbers and Deuteronomy, God commands that the Passover is not for Israel only, but for all who live in their land. There's Passover for the sojourner, one that is passing through as long as he identifies himself with Israel and believing in, in Jehovah, coming under the, the umbrella of Israel, he is allowed to take the Passover. In Numbers, uh, all who lived in Israel were able to partake of the Passover remembrance. Here's Numbers down at 914. If an alien sojourns among you, and observe the Passover to the Lord according to the statute of the Passover, according to its ordinance. So he shall do. You shall have one statute, both for the alien and for the native of the land. This is a good representation that the Passover is not solely for national identity. Okay? And in fact, the Passover was not the national salvation. We talked about this before. The Passover lamb is the opportunity for national salvation. Jesus Christ, our Passover, is an opportunity to be saved spiritually. God commands that the Passover is, uh, is a representation not solely for national identity, but is available for all who'd identify with Jehovah, Israel, and the coming Messiah. Likewise, Jesus came unto his own, which is Israel, but his sacrifice was beneficial to all. The Passover lamb Messiah was manifold in his functions. It was the substitution atonement for Israel as a nation. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So there is both a national concept of the individuals for his brethren, but also we can also take the idea of brethren being the fact that he was human. It was the cutting of the new covenant in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. There's a there's the, the, the cutting of the covenant of the new covenant does not mean it's initiated. It doesn't mean we're in it. I know there's a lot of people who would look at that and go, well, I think we're part of it or there's part of blessings. Um, well, we can all agree, at least, I take the stance that we're not under the new covenant at all. That's for Israel only. That in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, it deals with the concept, the fact that the cutting of the new covenant has been done. And in fact, we are ministers of the new covenant, just like Jeremiah was a minister of the new covenant, telling Israel about it. In fact, one of the selling points, if you would uh, use that type of vernacular, probably a bad choice of words, to a Jew about Jesus Christ is the fact that he initiated the new covenant, and it's a coming. To remind Israel about their new covenant in Jeremiah 31 through 33 is an important distinguishing remark you, you should make if you're witnessing to an Israelite, saying, it's coming. Do you want to be part of this new covenant? It was sufficient sacrifice for the whole world, as we saw in first and John 1 21 and 129. And we know first John 2 2, for he is the propitiation 
for our sins and not for ours only, but for all, for all also for those of the world. He is a propitiation of full, complete satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. Now, the result of the Passover, not only did the death of the lamb provide life from certain death for the firstborn, but it became means, okay? It was the means of escaping bondage. So it provided life and provided opportunity for redemption. If an Israelite says, I'm not going in that wilderness, I'm going to stay here in Egypt, could he have done so? If he was in that house, watching that blood covered and watching the destroyer pass over and hearing the wailing of Egypt, could he have stayed? Yes, he could have stayed submitted to Egypt. In fact, how many times did Israel as a nation try to go back? The sacrifice was not simply the done deal for redemption. The results of this um, aspect of, of, of Jesus Christ's Passover sacrifice is so similar to the redemption offer for all who would believe that to die Jesus in the Passover is nearly inconceivable. I keep on using that word. I'm not sure if I really know what it means. <laughs> The sacrifice of Jesus paid for sins, but not all are redeemed. Why? It's a vital point to make sure that we understand this. Just as the Passover protected the firstborn and provided the reason for Egypt to let Israel go in the Exodus account, it was not of said of Israel that they had been redeemed, saved from the Egyptians until they crossed the Red Sea and God defeated the Egyptian army by drowning them in the Red Sea. The Passover provided the reason to escape Egypt. Look what it says over here in, in Exodus chapter 14. The Lord saved Israel that day. That day? What day is this? This is after they found the bodies of the, of the Egyptians dead on the seashore after crossing the Red Sea. And Israel saw the Egyptians on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they believed in Jehovah. One of the key phrases throughout all the scriptures. They believed in God. Abraham believed in God and it was recounted to him as righteousness. Israel believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. After the crossing of the Red Sea and the destruction of Egypt, the entire congregation believed Therefore, the events of the Passover were not the redemption of Israel. But later, after they considered everything, the people believed the Lord. So, all the details of Exodus 4 through 12 were considered and Israel was redeemed. They looked at all the situation, of all the plagues, of all the situation that happened and go, Yes, in fact, this God, Jehovah, is in fact our God and we believe in him. They were redeemed physically as a nation, and they were individually and spiritually redeemed when they believed. Obviously, in this in this dispensation, there is no um, there is no national redemption from the Gentiles during this dispensation, right? Where am I at? Okay, I'll back up. Currently, there's no national redemption for the Gentile nations. Jesus Christ, the final Passover, paid for all sins. But individual spiritual redemption only takes place when that person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. His sacrifice pays for all sin, but this only makes redemption possible. In the Passover, the redemption was from, the, from Egypt to the promised land. And this Im imagery is symbolic of the unbeliever being moved from the position of death to life. Freedom in Christ Jesus. And again, as we've mentioned before, it's not simply from the, the freedom of uh, from sin as far as the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. This is how effective that cross work is, especially when the individual believes it. And Titus, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And what else? Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our God, great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. 
who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The cross work of Christ and that Passover sacrifice is effective for all when you believe. As we have seen the foreshadowing of Jesus, the Messiah in the Passover is clear. The unleavened bread is a picture of leaving the old sin master behind. Jesus Christ is the unblemished lamb. The unblemished lamb of God. His sacrifice was a substitution for the death of others. That atonement. And the Passover is not for Israel only, but available for all. Finally, the Passover provides opportunity for all to be redeemed. In like manner, Jesus presents opportunities to all based upon his sacrifice. To the unbeliever, the promise of eternal life is offered. Believe it. It's true. To the believer, the promise of, of internal peace and contentment to all who understand, believe, and follow his plan for this life. Thank you for paying attention, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again, and I'll be sending out emails and hopefully be able to video conference with you as we move forward. For now, let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for your truth, for who you are, our God, our Savior. The provisions of Passover are vast in the fact that you fulfilled it nearly 2,000 years ago. We thank you for who you are, and we look forward to your coming again. And come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. You are the one who will be able to get us out of this peril of this earth. I'm not talking about COVID, about the whole earth. But for now, since we're here, let us do good. Let us encourage one another, and let us share the gospel with all who need to hear. Thank you and praise you. Help us to enjoy the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day. Enjoy your Passover.